The Southport Air Show 2022 was proof, should proof be needed, that this is one of the go-to seaside air shows in the UK. A mix of real rarities and old favourites performing in particularly photogenic conditions. The typhoon and even the red arrows whipping up spectacular clouds of vapour in the humid sea air. Representing the warbirds, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight performed a three-ship display and there was an increasingly rare airshow appearance by Peter Teichman in his P-51D Mustang. And then there was the Black Eagles, performing their first European airshow in nearly ten years, a five-minute teaser ahead of Riyadh the following week. This is our pick of the action. Hello and welcome to a very windy Southport for the Southport Air Show 2022, which I think is the very first seaside air show that we've ever covered on air show dispatches. Of course, the main reason we're here is the Republic of Korea Air Force Black Eagles. It's their first public display in Europe for 10 years. I was down at Boscombe Down the other day, though, watching them practice, and it must be said, they are very, very good indeed. There is, however, a full afternoon of aerial entertainment. It's not just the Black Eagles. So join me, why not, over the next hour as we bring you the highlights of the Southport Air Show 2022. We start with the Black Eagles, approaching now for the first of several flybys, and here in canard formation. And I said, didn't I, in the last episode, that our next show would be Mew in France. Indeed, we were filming at Mew last weekend, but when the Black Eagles were officially confirmed for Southport, we decided to split the team. I headed north to go and film then. Uh, a last-minute addition to our schedule, Nigel was down in Mew. That episode is still coming. This is not a full display. The team is operating from Boscombe down and only have enough fuel for about five minutes of flypasts after the transit. So it serves as something of a teaser for their full performance at the Royal International Air Tattoo next weekend. That will be the full 25 minute performance. Now, diamond formation and the team enters a 360 degree left hand turn with two further formation changes. Not easy formation changes either, swapping between very compact and very wide formation shapes into Albatross there and now collapsing back down into Eagle which represents the T-50.
The first and only time the Black Eagles had previously visited Europe was in 2012, when they won the award for the best display at the Waddington Air Show, and had the rare distinction of being double award winners at the Air Tattoo, and it would be no surprise to see them once again achieve that honour in a few days' time. And that final fly past in victory formation is all that we're going to get. A combination of low cloud and long transit flights does rather stunt that performance, but you won't find many teams who could do a better job under those constraints. And following that, we're going to start working our way through the other flying display items in a roughly chronological order as they flew on the Saturday show, starting with the Tigers parachute display team from the British Army. The jump ship they are using is rather interesting. It's a Pacific Aircraft Corporation 750XL short takeoff and landing aircraft designed and built in New Zealand, and it comes from Skydive Northwest based up at Kark. Sadly, this was another act to be hampered by that low cloud, performing just about the lowest low show that can safely be executed. No fancy tricks, but some very nicely coordinated descents in extremely blustery conditions. One of the great air show favourites of the past 10 years or so is Rich Goodwin, seen here flying his new, highly modified Pitts S2E, pointing into wind here and hanging the aircraft on its prop. It's already got a modified Lycoming AEIO 540 engine. If you look this aircraft up in the CAA registry, you'll see they've had to give the engine its own name, the AEIO 540 Goodwin RS. It produces a thousand pounds of thrust, which gives the aircraft a power to weight ratio of about 0.7 to 1 at the moment, which is just about enough for Rich to prop hang like that. But the aircraft still has a lot of potential yet to be unleashed because Rich is in the process of modifying it so that it can fly with two jet engines on the nose. That will increase the power to weight ratio to somewhere in the region of 1.1 to 1. That means it'll be able to sit in the hover indefinitely and maybe even accelerate slowly out of that hover. Very dramatic snap rolls there using the aircraft's enormous control surfaces. The rudder particularly is very much larger than the rudder on a standard pit. Other modifications include very high performance custom made wings with a larger than standard wing area and enlarged ailerons which gives better low speed performance and an improved roll rate. must be a nightmare to certify, particularly given that unlike in the United States, we don't have an experimental aircraft category here in the UK. Any modifications need to be specifically approved by the regulator as part of the aircraft's permit to fly, and this has certainly slowed down the development process of this aircraft. But all going well, it should be flying with jets in the foreseeable future. In engineering terms at least, it's ready now to begin test flights. Now Rich's trademark manoeuvre to end the display, a knife edge pass down the display line.
The first of three Spitfires next, and this one is a Mark 5B from the Historic Aircraft Collection, based at Duxford. Along with HAC's Hurricane, the Spitfire forms part of the Polish Heritage Flight. It actually flew in its wartime career with 315 and 317 Polish fighter squadrons, and although it's painted in Battle of Britain style camouflage, it wears the markings of 317 Fighter Squadron, which was founded in 1941. That is in recognition not only of this specific aircraft's history, but also of the contribution of Polish pilots more generally to the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. The Polish contribution to the RAF is perhaps underestimated by many. They were the largest contingent of foreign pilots fighting with the RAF during the Battle of Britain, and thanks to their previous combat experience during the German invasion of Poland in 1939, their skills often proved to be more developed than those of their British counterparts. They flew everything from the Spitfire to the Hurricane, the Mustang and the Mosquito, and by the end of the war, almost 20,000 Poles were serving with the Polish units of the RAF. This is, in a way, a homecoming event for BM 597, because while flying with that Polish squadron, it was based at RAF Wood Vale, which was only about five miles down the road from Southport. A victory roll concludes our look back at this performance. Well, more Spitfires later on, but we move on to the 1950s now, and the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron's SB Lim II masquerading here as a MiG-15 BIS. The MiG-15 was the first jet fighter of the Soviet Union, and the SB Lim II is a single-seat MiG-15 BIS modified in Poland into a two-seat training aircraft, basically equivalent to the MiG-15 UTI.
You might wonder then why it is painted in the colours of the US Air Force. That dates back to the early 1950s when American pilots fighting in the Korean War began to report that the MiG-15 was far more potent than anything the West had in its inventory. And so the US Air Force launched Operation Moolah, an attempt to incentivize MiG pilots to defect to the West and bring their aircraft with them so the Americans could unpick its secrets. The operation was not a success. Nobody did, in fact, defect as a result. But in 1953, Lieutenant No Kum Sok flew his MiG-15 BIS to Kimpo Air Base in South Korea. He was unaware of Operation Moolah and declined to take his financial reward. But the MiG was very quickly disassembled and transported to Japan and later to the United States for testing and examination. Flight testing lasted 11 days and was undertaken in part by Chuck Yeager. The aircraft was painted in a temporary American colour scheme during that time and that's what this scheme represents. The defecting aircraft itself is now on display in the National Museum of the US Air Force. Our only contribution from the Royal Navy comes from the team that was once known as the Black Cats. That was back when they performed two ship displays, but now due to the high operational tempo of the Wildcat fleet, it's just a singleton and it's known as the Wildcat Demo Team. Derived from the Lynx HMA-8, the Wildcat entered service in 2014 and is the Navy's primary anti-surface warfare helicopter. It also serves in the light utility and search and rescue roles and is reportedly even capable of taking on I-Star duties, that is, intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance. At a glance, it may look like a Lynx with some extra sensors bolted on, but the Wildcat brings a whole new level of capability. 95% of the components are new. It has a more powerful engine, a longer range, a higher maximum takeoff weight, new rotors, new avionics, new radar, and unlike the Lynx, it has a largely composite construction. But perhaps the most remarkable thing about the Wildcat is just how tough it is. This is a helicopter designed from the ground up to be able to smash itself into the deck of a pitching rolling frigate and sustain an awful lot of G on its landing gear without taking any damage. Little wonder then that it's not just the Royal Navy that has invested in the Wildcat program. The Philippines and South Korea both have the Wildcat in service and the British Army has the type on order as well. Following that, we return to the Second World War and we go now to a display that makes me feel a little bit nostalgic because the pilot of this aircraft is Peter Teichmann. Thank you. 
When I started going to air shows in the UK not that long ago, in around 2014, Peter Teichmann was perhaps the dominant and most respected warbird pilot on the circuit. So I and many others were sad to see him retire at the end of the 2018 season. That retirement, however, didn't last, and he returned to the airshow circuit for three events in 2021, showing off his newly restored Russian scheme Spitfire. You can see a video of one of those performances in Airshow Dispatch's Series 4, Episode 2, from the Midlands Air Festival 2021. The way world events have unfolded since then means that displaying an aircraft with the Red Star of the Russian Air Force is no longer socially or politically acceptable. But that has given the opportunity for Peter to bring some of his other aircraft back onto the circuit. Lovely to see Peter's distinctive style of display back on the airshow circuit once again with his trademark mix of low passes and graceful barrel rolls, taking great care to point the nose of the aircraft straight at the spectators before pitching up into those rolls. Our next display item is a solo Mark 80A Strike Master from North Wales Military Aviation Services, the company that's given us the very popular Strike Master Display UK pair. Now we've seen that pair's display already this year, you can watch it in episode 2 from the Midlands Air Festival, so we're not going to look for too long at this solo performance, which also happened to take place during pretty much the least interesting weather conditions of the day. For those who didn't watch that earlier episode, the Strike Master is a light attack version of the venerable Jet Provost trainer, developed for the export market in the 1960s. They served with 10 official export customers, this one is an ex-Royal Saudi Air Force example, but today it wears the colours of the Royal Air Force of Oman. A lovely derry turn here, rolling one way, then turning the other. A tail chasing manoeuvre popularised at air shows by the great test pilot John Derry. Now, second Spitfire of the day. And it's also an aircraft that we saw in that episode from the Midlands Air Festival.
The Spitfire PR-19 of the Rolls-Royce Heritage flight giving us a particularly noticeable demonstration of the throaty growl produced by the Griffin as opposed to the softer purr of the Merlin. PR stands for Photo Reconnaissance, indicating this was an unarmed aircraft that would fly deep into enemy territory to gather mission information ahead of bombing raids. But actually, despite its designation, this particular aeroplane was not used for photography. Rather, it was used for weather research and forecasting. After the war, it became a founding member of the unit that we now call the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, which we'll be seeing later on. We'll look now at a pair of Royal Air Force training aircraft, one very much still in service, but this one having been retired 12 years ago. It's the Slingsby T-67 Firefly, which is derived from a French product, the Fournier RF-6. Slingsby built the type under licence in the UK with a much more powerful engine, a Lycoming AIO 540 rather than the original Continental O200, and they had a great deal more export success than Fournier ever did. It was used as a training aircraft by eight air arms, including the air forces of the United States and the United Kingdom, and four of those air arms still operate the type today. You may remember from the Midlands Air Festival episode, we showed a Grob Tutor in an experimental black and yellow paint scheme. Well, this is what that paint scheme was based on. And if you want to know more about that experimental scheme, then you'll have to go and watch that episode of Airshow Dispatches. But here is the Firefly's replacement in British service, the Grob Tutor. In many ways, the Firefly is actually the superior aircraft of the two. It had 
a higher performance wing that produced a rather better roll rate, and it had a lot more power available to it. That makes the Tutor display all the more impressive though, because it isn't just a display of the pilot's aerobatic prowess, but also a demonstration of his energy management skills. Luckily then, the Tutor Display pilot this year is Flight Lieutenant David John Gibbs, who has experience displaying gliders, the ultimate test of energy management. This for him is a rather special event because Southport is his hometown show. Look carefully at this barrel roll now to see what I mean about the Tutor's slower roll rate and you can actually see that roll rate degrade at the top of the manoeuvre where the aircraft's airspeed is at its lowest. Sticking with the Royal Air Force, we're going to look now at one of the stars of any seaside air show, not perhaps for the quality of the display, which was rather more genteel than that of the other Warbird performances we've seen in this programme, but for the sheer rarity of one of the aircraft involved. It's the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight with their traditional trio of Spitfire, Hurricane and Lancaster. Now the aircraft will split and we'll see firstly the solo display by the Spitfire Mark 9 in its desert camouflage scheme representing the work of 92 Squadron RAF in the North Africa Theatre in 1943. Again, just grazing the bottoms of the clouds, making for some rather dynamic footage.
and now it's the turn of the Hurricane, a Mark IIc in a rather interesting black paint scheme that photographers love to hate. That's because this represents a Night Fighter Hurricane from 247 Squadron, complete with a matte black all over finish and half sized low visibility versions of the RAF Roundel. A victory roll now concludes the Hurricane's brief performance and it clears the way for the Lancaster. I've said it before, but it's such a delight to see the Lancaster displaying again after being inactive for the best part of two years. It's one of only two Lancasters flying in the world, the others in Canada, as I'm sure you know, but it'll hopefully soon be joined by a third, currently undergoing a slow restoration to flight at East Kirkby. And indeed, we'll likely be covering the East Kirkby Air Show in an upcoming episode of Air Show Dispatches, where their partially restored Lancaster will be performing taxi runs. It'll either be East Kirkby or Fleetfest and Dalayana. We haven't decided which one to cover just yet. And the BBMF contribution continues now as the Spitfire Mark 9 joins up with the Typhoon FGR4. Something we last saw in 2015. It was rather more sophisticated a display on that occasion which required both aircraft to launch for a dedicated sortie. This is a shorter, simpler affair that just serves as a transition between the two performances, but still a very welcome addition to the airshow circuit indeed. Now get ready for the Typhoon solo display, accompanied by quite a lot of vapour. Braking now.
and in now to the double corkscrew, a pair of very rapid high G rolls that carries the aircraft away from the crowd on the left 45, giving the pilot the space he needs to turn hard now back onto the B axis for an aileron roll and then up into a loop with yet more vapour. Here showing off the aircraft's 250 degree per second roll rate, rolling through 1260 degrees. And now approaching from the right for a fast pass at 550 knots, breaking into a 9G barrel roll. Well, you've just seen the aircraft flying at 550 knots, just below the speed of sound. But here is the other end of the scale, a 120 knot high alpha pass, uniquely being performed on the B axis in this year's Typhoon display. Now get ready for another on-crowd loaded roll. Quite a lot of them in this performance because the cloud base was not sufficient for Flight Lieutenant Adam O'Hare to perform the taller looping manoeuvres. Lovely vapour though during this display, which is created because the air going over the top of the wing, especially at high G load, is at a lower pressure than the air going over the bottom. That low pressure air is cooled below its dew point, causing the moisture within it to condense, and that's the clouds that we see forming around the aircraft's upper surfaces. memorable that was but now we look to the other extreme to an aircraft with not much power but still quite remarkable performance it is the rotorsport calidus autogyro flown here by peter davis who has done so much to promote this aircraft over the years and contribute to its outstanding sales success It's a display that is brilliantly dynamic and very close to the crowd, thanks to the special dispensation he has to fly just 75 metres in front of the spectators. Most other aircraft have to be at least 150 or 230 metres away.
a spiral descent there using the same principles as a sycamore seed, an unpowered rotor that is in a perpetual state of auto rotation, providing just enough lift to slow the aircraft's descent. Of course, in level flight, Peter can use that 100 horsepower Rotax 912 engine at the back of the aircraft to propel it forwards. That enables the rotor blades above him to produce even more lift, and hence, sustained flight is achieved. It's not just a toy though, it's got two seats, a heated cockpit and a range of 500 miles, making it a very capable touring aircraft and quite a cost-effective one. Penultimate display now, the blades flying just two of their usual four extra 300s, with the others currently undergoing maintenance. But a nicely choreographed routine that doesn't make it too obvious that there are aircraft missing. A pair of stall turns now, just in the bottom of the clouds. This manoeuvre is called Falling Angels and it usually includes pushovers by the other two aircraft. And now they dive back in towards show centre on the B-axis for the crossfire break. The plan had been for these extra 300s to be replaced at some time between 2019 and 2022, with the new aircraft being the Gamebird GB1. That doesn't seem to have come to fruition, and we don't know what the timescale now is for that project, but a four-ship of Gamebirds will be quite a sight to see. Incidentally, the Chilean aerobatic team, the Halcons, completed their transition to the Gamebird this year, becoming the first aerobatic team in the world to do so. But the Extra 300 is still a very capable aerobatic performer, even if not to the same standard as the Gamebird. And you can see it here doing a torque roll, using the torque of the engine to rotate the aircraft even with zero airspeed. The Extra 300L version has proved particularly popular, not least because there's room for a passenger. And that is a capability the blades make good use of, offering pleasure flights on various dates throughout the summer. Pulling up now into a quarter clover. This would normally be a vertical break, but instead the two aircraft remaining in line astern. And pulling up again for the heart. And doesn't that look great above the symmetrical shapes of the lighting poles on Southport Pier? And we're 
very grateful to Sefton Council for affording us this viewing position, by the way. A new manoeuvre now, with one aircraft performing a rolling circle, a gentle turn while continuously rolling, while the second aircraft barrel rolls around its smoke trail. And that just about concludes the performance, just one final split to go. Well it's now the turn of the final act of the show. It's the Red Arrows. Pulling up there for the first loop, it's the only loop they'll do because of the residual low cloud. The shape changes there from wall to seven arrow, but it's a transition they're not quite getting right this year. Red Seven well behind his teammates as they apex that loop. They don't seem quite up to their usual standards this season with the quality of some of the formation keeping. There, vapour from the Red Arrows. It's not very often you see that from a Hawk, and that proves just how humid it was. And it's one of the great benefits of holding air shows over or very close to the sea. So we've gone down to the rolling show now. Normally this would be the lightning loop, but instead we're just getting a present. But it's not the flat show yet, because here comes the Phoenix Roll. But there's still some cloud around as you can see and that moment there probably scuppers any further attempt at rolling. From this point we'll move into the flat show, but it must be said the Red Arrows flat show is particularly good, much more dynamic than the flat shows performed by many other aerobatic teams around the world, perhaps partly because of how often the Red Arrows have to fly it. Now the Apollo present. But that's too close. Much, much too close. It should have been on the 230 metre line, but ended up directly over the crowd there. Not suggesting anything was actually unsafe, but it certainly ate into the safety margins that are very sensibly put in place. That manoeuvre, Tornado, concludes the first half of the display and we now step up the pace as we enter the second half, starting with Detonator. Reds 1-5 breaking first, the Synchro pair underneath. And now they converge on show centre for the opposition barrel rolls.
The synchro pair now arrive for the corkscrew. And that's very close again. Come on guys, let's not make a habit of this. I certainly can't remember in the past being quite so aware of these creeping little errors, getting too close, not being quite in formation and so on. Um, I think I've seen probably more of them in just the first month of the 2022 season than I did in the whole of the preceding four or five seasons combined. Uh, we talked in the previous episodes about the rather challenging pre-season the Red Arrows have had, and I'm not going to go into that again. Massive respect to them for getting through it, uh, but let's hope they can clean things up a bit as the season goes on. Now the final manoeuvre, not an infinity break as usual, but a standard bomb burst, perhaps Red 1 being a little bit cautious after getting too close to the crowd earlier on in the display. With that, we end our look back at the Southport Air Show 2022. Next time, we'll be at Mew for that long-promised episode focusing on the Normandy near men. Until then, thank you very much for joining us. From me, Adam Landau, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>